Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tim Erlin, VP of Strategy at Tripwire, and I'm here today to talk about building a foundation for zero trust. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's a relatively hot topic in the industry today, but it's one that has a lot of history as well. Um, and I think I want to start with a little bit of clarification around zero trust itself. First of all, Zero Trust is not a product. Uh, despite what many vendors might want to tell you or want you to believe, you can't simply purchase Zero Trust and implement it as a technology. Um, that idea is, of course, very tempting. But the reality is that Zero Trust is really a, a concept. Um, it's a set of principles, uh, and those principles guide an implementation that requires not just technology, but also people and process. Um, so yes, Zero Trust requires products to support it, but it's bigger than that. Um, the concept of, of zero trust is really both, both simple and profound. Um, in order to understand it, we have to sort of look to the, the past, to the history of how we authenticate and establish trust in a networked environment. In the past, we've established trust in what I would call a very sort of human compatible or human intuitive way. Once we identify a person or a device um, and we decide what they have access to, uh, we've then persisted that trust over time. So, um, I gain the ability to, to access a network by the fact that I've, I've plugged my device into a particular network port or by the fact that I've provided a specific set of credentials. And then I'm always trusted to access those resources going forward. That's sort of that persistence of trust. Um, so identity and location. Now, the technology that we use on a day-to-day -day basis has obviously changed. Um, and so has our process for establishing trust. The, the way that I would think about it is that, you know, the perimeter, very simply, isn't what it used to be. So as that perimeter has shifted and moved, we've had to adapt uh, the way that we establish and maintain trust for the purpose of accessing important resources um, in any environment. Um, now, zero trust as a concept um, really is born out of that shifting technology landscape. And in order to understand where zero trust is today, we do have to look at its evolution a little bit. Um, so if the, the core of zero trust is really about removing that implicit trust that I was talking about and then granting trust on a case by case basis, the starting point for doing that is really at the network level. Um, and you can think back to uh, network access control, um, a term that, that has sort of, uh, you know, some historical context. Um, but ultimately is sort of the genesis of, of some of the zero trust concepts that we, we work with today. The idea being that instead of assuming that because I'm on uh, or connected to a network that I have access to all of the resources on that network, um, that you're going to validate that trust continuously. Zero trust network access might be the term that you're, you're looking for there. And that, that um, I'm going to be authenticated to the network rather than simply uh, connected physically um, and that physical connection giving me access. Now, the second step, and of course, um, you know, this is sort of a three step evolution that I'm describing. There are lots of details in here that we're not going to cover. But the second step is to move from sort of zero trust network access as a concept to what many call micro segmentation. The idea here is that I'm taking that networked environment still focused on the, the network level. And I'm, I'm dividing it up into smaller pieces and determining access based on those micro segments. So instead of saying I've authenticated uh, and I can have access to all the resources on the network because of that authentication, I now have to um, validate trust or authenticate for uh, different segments of that network, um, or my authentication gives me permissions to different segments of that network. But fundamentally, the important part is the the smaller slices of the network or the the resources to which individual entities users or devices have access that's kind of that micro segmentation step and then the the third step in the evolution is to trust policy evaluation um, so a trust policy engine and here you've moved from the network layer to more of the application of the data layer and the resources and requesters, if you will, involved are different. So you've got uh, devices, assets, you've got users, you've got applications, you may have data itself, and all of those requests for access uh, from a requester to a resource are passed through a policy engine that effectively evaluates, that establishes and evaluates trust on a case-by-case -case basis and on a session-by-session -session basis. This is kind of the, 
the the ideal uh, of zero trust, um, if you will. And of course, the ideal is hard to attain um, across an entire environment. So all of these examples are, are examples of zero trust architecture. Um, they're all different from each other, but they all have value in terms of um, the concept of zero trust. And there is a, a pitfall to watch out for here, um, which is to make the perfect the enemy of the good. If your goal is to improve security in your environment, um, adopting zero trust is a, a good way to do that. Um, trying to adopt perfect zero trust all the time across your entire environment uh, may put you in a position where um, you're destined to fail to get to that ideal and you therefore don't make any progress when incremental progress is definitely possible and you can incrementally eliminate threats in that environment as well. Now we've talked about the concept of zero trust um, and that's important, but I wanna talk about integrity monitoring as well because that's the other half of this conversation. And the place I always start with integrity monitoring is with this phrase, every incident begins with a change. Now, the more I think about this particular phrase, the more true it becomes. Um, this idea that every incident begins with a change is fundamental to the value of integrity monitoring. Um, so it's worth sort of really focusing in on that statement. What does change mean uh, in this context? Well, importantly, change isn't homogenous. Change isn't all of the same type. Uh, and I like to think about change um, from an internal and an external perspective to sort of get that full picture of how change is related to incidents. When we talk about internal change, it's relatively easy to come up with examples of how an internal change might lead to an incident. So for example, you might have a change in firewall permissions that allows uh, previously um, unaccessible ass assets to be accessed, new internal access. That creates an opportunity for an incident or for an attacker to compromise something. Uh, a change in storage permissions might expose data that wasn't previously exposed. A change in user permissions might give new access to a user they didn't previously have. Newly installed software might expose a vulnerability that wasn't there before, or a change in a database configuration might provide unauthenticated access to data that should have authentication. Those are all internal changes that can generate an incident. There are also external changes that can generate incidents. So a few examples here. Um, a, a new vulnerability might be discovered in an application. So you, you have an application installed, it isn't vulnerable. A new vulnerability is discovered, now it is vulnerable. You haven't changed something internally, but that change externally has created an opportunity for risk internally. Um, a new form of malware might be released. Uh, a, an attacker might get an influx of resources, which is an interesting one because it's not a technical change, uh, but an attacker who previously was unable to carry out their attack now has the resources to do so. A supplier in your supply chain might be compromised. A cloud provider might uh, introduce a configuration change that um, introduces risk for you as well. So those are all external changes that also have an impact on, um, uh, on the potential for an incident. Now, importantly, any incident actually involves multiple changes. So it's not just one change and then an incident, it's actual, actually multiple changes uh, that can be involved in the life cycle of an incident, if you will. And there's a good way for us to think about this, a framework uh, to think about how changes and incidents are related, especially in a security context. Um, and that's the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So if you're not familiar with MITRE ATT&CK, um, it's a pretty useful tool, a framework um, developed by the nonprofit um, corporation MITRE uh, in order to allow organizations to categorize uh, the techniques and the, the, the procedures that are uh, part of every attack. So a taxonomy, if you will. Um, and these are the, the, uh, the techniques uh, that are listed here. Um, you've got, um, uh, sorry, these are the tactics that are listed here and underneath each tactic there are techniques. Um, so reconnaissance, resource development, uh, lateral movement, collection, command and control, et cetera. Uh, so just as a thought exercise, I thought it would be good to take a couple of examples of changes that uh, are related to those particular tactics in the attack framework. So for example, as an attacker goes through their process, um, ultimately trying to get to uh, a, an objective that that attacker has, they might start with reconnaissance. Um, in that case, changes in permissions in your environment might expose information that wasn't previously exposed that that attacker needs in order to carry out their objective. Now, I'm not gonna go through each one of these. I'm just gonna pick out some examples. Um, further into that life cycle, um, in the execution tactic, you might find that the attacker creates a scheduled job somewhere to accomplish something uh, in the environment. That scheduled job, the creation of that scheduled job is a change uh, that can be detected. 
for privilege escalation, you might have an attacker create and run new system services uh, in order to establish a, you know, escalated privilege. That's a change as well. Um, on lateral movement, um, an attacker might compromise deployment tools in your environment in order to push malware to the endpoints. That's also a change. And then on exfiltration, uh, in order to exfiltrate data, uh, the attacker might actually create files, maybe archive files, uh, zipped files, if you will. They have to be stored somewhere as they're created. That creation of a file is a change as well. So you can see how change and the attack framework tactics, the tactics used in a, an attack, um, are related to each other. Change occurs at every step in the process uh, for an attacker. So we've talked a lot about change detection, but we haven't really talked about integrity monitoring yet because um, it's important to understand that detecting changes is only part of that integrity monitoring equation. Um, in fact, raw change detection is fairly difficult to manage and can ultimately create distraction. Um, changes occur in environments all the time. Um, most of those changes are legitimate. So the key question is here is how you sort the good from the bad, or, or uh, to put it more, more succinctly or specifically, how you sort the, the authorized from the unauthorized when you're talking about change. And that's where integrity monitoring comes into play. Um, integrity monitoring, you can think of it this way, integrity monitoring is a process built on top of change detection. And integrity monitoring really has to start by establishing um, a baseline. So I'm going to talk through the four steps of, of integrity monitoring, uh, and the goal here is to establish and maintain a trusted state. That first step, as I just mentioned, is to establish a trusted baseline. What does that mean? Well, when you're performing the process of integrity monitoring, you, you don't start by detecting changes. You start by understanding the desired state of the assets in your environment. Um, that baseline, ideally a trusted baseline, um, needs to exist for every asset in order to understand the context of the changes that are occur. So without a baseline, you're doing change detection, not integrity monitoring. The second step is to detect changes to that baseline. So this is where that change detection functionality fits into the overall process of integrity monitoring. The baseline defines what to monitor, um, and uh, then you monitor those objects in the baseline for changes. Um, and the baseline helps determine what when those changes are meaningful to the, the organization. And then uh, once you're detecting changes against a baseline, when you detect authorized changes, then you want to update the baseline with those changes. So change data has to be reconciled uh, to some kind of a source to determine whether or not it's authorized or unauthorized, um, and then determine if it becomes part of the baseline. And it's important that, that uh, automation is a key part of this step. So if you're trying to manually reconcile changes in an environment of any size, you're very quickly going to be overwhelmed. You have to be able to automate that change reconciliation process. And then last, but certainly not least, you want to investigate and remediate unauthorized or suspicious changes. So uh, the changes that aren't authorized become automatically unauthorized. And those are the, the changes you want to focus your attention on. So automate authorization, focus your attention on unauthorized or suspicious changes and then determine whether they should have been authorized, whether they're evidence of a broken change control process, or whether they're malicious changes that need to be addressed as, a, as an incident. And keep in mind that the unauthorized change, regardless of whether it's malicious or not, ultimately creates or produces unplanned work. So this process of um, integrity monitoring reduces unplanned work in an environment. And so that brings us to sort of the connection point here in this conversation, that integrity monitoring is foundational to zero trust. Um, and, and that's really what we're here to talk about, is that foundational component for a successful zero trust architecture. Now, it, it seems ironic, but it's an important statement to make, that zero trust relies on trust. Um, a, a successful implementation of a zero trust architecture depends on establishing trust. Um, in order to make access decisions, trust has to be established for both the requester and the resource being requested. Um, and, and more importantly, you can argue, trust has to be established for the underlying systems supporting that zero trust architecture. So let's talk about establishing trust. Um, there are all kinds of infrastructure components that underpin a zero trust architecture. I've put up some examples here, right? You've obviously got uh, in a variety of, of authentication mechanisms or um, tools that are used to as part of a zero trust architecture. You've got databases, you've got the network components that support 
the applications and the servers that are involved in the zero trust architecture. You've got the security controls uh, that sit on top of a zero trust architecture. Um, you've got the identities themselves. You've certainly got the process involved um, in zero trust and the data behind it as well. Uh, and these components are um, are really key to uh, a successful zero trust architecture. If you start from the perspective that your identity provider or or say the database it relies on or the switch that that passes its traffic is compromised. If that's your starting assumption, which is part of a, a core tenant of zero trust, then your first step in building a zero trust architecture has to be establishing uh, trust in those very components that that are underpinning that arch architecture. Doing that requires that you start with describing their trusted state and measuring it. Um, now that might sound familiar. That's intentional. That's the baseline activity that we just talked about with integrity monitoring. Establish what that trusted state is for every asset involved in the zero trusted zero trust architecture has to be the first step. Of course, you have to manage. Um, uh, ongoing trustworthiness as well in those architectural components, because zero trust also relies on establishing ongoing trustworthiness for the components that are involved in the zero trust architecture itself. Um, at, you know, as it points out, trust isn't to be assumed going forward. So in order to ensure that your zero trust components and the infrastructure supporting them can continue to be trusted, you have to ensure that they stay in a trusted state. Again, that might sound familiar because that's calls back to the integrity monitoring conversation we just had. Integrity monitoring provides just that service, monitoring for changes that take those components out of a trusted state. So in order to have a successful zero trust architecture, you have to start with that baseline of trustworthiness for the architectural components, and you have to be able to measure uh, and monitor for changes that take them out of their trustworthy state so that they can continue providing that service to the environment. Uh, in order to have a successful zero trust architecture. So we can we can summarize that by saying that a zero trust architecture is only possible if the integrity of the systems involved is assured. Um, and that bears repeating, right? Zero trust architecture is only possible if the integrity of those systems involved in that zero trust architecture is assured. Now, integrity is part of, of some of the, the core principles of zero trust as well. So this is not something that that I'm inventing here. Um, if you go look at the NIST definition of zero trust, which is uh, in NIST uh, Special Publication 800-207, um, there are a couple of different quotes about uh, integrity there that I've put up here. So one of them is a core tenant, um, what they call a core tenant of zero trust, that the enterprise ensures all owned and associated systems are in the most secure state possible and monitors systems to ensure that they remain in the most secure state possible. That's a description of integrity monitoring. Um, you've also got the enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. So these two pieces, they speak to integrity monitoring, but they don't really describe how foundational integrity monitoring is to a successful zero trust architecture. What they're really aiming for there is that need or requirement to assess security posture. Um, so there are two bookends here to talk about in terms of integrity monitoring and zero trust. One is that Integrity monitoring is a foundational piece for establishing a successful zero trust architecture, as we've talked about. The other is the role that integrity uh, plays in assessing security posture, um, which is also part of zero trust. So when you're uh, assessing whether or not a requester or a resource has access to a resource, there are a couple things that you want to assess there. Um, so we want to say that assessing security posture requires integrity, um, and that's important. So this is a, a slightly different picture um, of, uh, you know, sort of a, a zero trust architecture, a little bit more detail here. Um, you've got access requests, you've got resources, they're going through a trust policy evaluation engine. The access requests are coming from different things, assets, users, apps, um, the resources can be different things. And there's context being put into that trust policy evaluation. Um, if you if you Google for zero trust architecture images, there are lots and lots of different options, more complex, less complex, but they all bo boil down to one fundamental um, one fundamental question that zero trust is asking continuously, which is can the requester be trusted to access the requested resource? And that's where we go back to establishing and maintaining trust. Now, stepping away from the zero trust architecture itself and into the the operations of zero trust. 
the requesters coming in and requesting access. There are really two primary ways to establish trust in that process. One is identity, uh, and the other is security posture. Now, identity is delivered by an identity provider. There are lots of great identity providers out there. Security posture is a little bit more complex because there isn't, isn't as much a, a single industry built around security posture as there is around identity. So I want to talk a little bit about what it takes to establish or evaluate security posture in a zero trust architecture. Um, here we've got a list of, of things that should be considered as part of that process of establishing trust uh, for an access requester. Um, the configuration of that, that requester, vulnerability uh, posture of that requester, compliance uh, status of that uh, requester, integrity monitoring is included here as well, and threat intelligence is included as well. Um, and I'll step through each of these. So. Um, security configuration management, um, or SCM. Some people call this security configuration assessment, um, but fundamentally, this is the process of determining whether an asset uh, is configured in a secure way according to some kind of guidance. Now, there's industry guidance that you can get. Center for Internet Security is great. They produce a whole bunch of benchmarks uh, for lots of different platforms. NIST provides a lot of guidance here. Uh, MITRE has guidance. Um, the US federal government uh, uh, organization DISA um, provides guidance in what they call um, STIGs. Uh, you know, you can choose any one of these as sort of the starting point. Uh, the point is that you are assessing the assets against a uh, configuration standard for security. And it matters for zero trust. It matters because assessing the security configuration of those requesters coming in, whether they're assets or applications, is really a key requirement for zero trust. You have to determine whether that that um, access request coming in is coming from a, a appropriately secured uh, requester. Um, and so that's a, a key starting point for assessing security posture. Now, policy compliance. Policy compliance is um, a little bit like security configuration, but it's focused more on a regulatory requirement. And it's also important to zero trust. You might think that, that security compliance is enough, but in many cases, determining whether an asset is compliant with policy is also an important requirement for determining whether access is allowed. Uh, if you're allowing access from assets that aren't appropriately compliant for the type of resource that they're requesting, um, you can generate the, the risk for um, regulatory fines. So um, attackers um, are one type of, of, uh, of incident or one type of, of uh, uh, perpetrator. Auditors can be another type. Um, so it's important to include policy compliance as part of the overall equation for zero trust. Now, vulnerability management is also a relatively um, well understood and obvious component for um, uh, authenticating assets in a zero trust architecture. Um, determining whether an asset has um, uh, vulnerabilities is a relatively straightforward process. Understanding the threshold of vulnerability that should prevent them from having access is a, is a more difficult thing to determine. So it's important that you have uh, the ability to actually assess not just whether vulnerabilities exist, but how severe those vulnerabilities are, um, whether or not they reach a particular threshold determined by your organization, uh, and maybe even on a resource by resource basis uh, to determine whether or not they're allowed to have access. Uh, and then also integrity monitoring shows up here as well. So we talked about integrity monitoring as a foundational component for zero trust, but it's also part of the uh, security posture assessment process for zero trust. Um, so if you're, you're assessing your environment uh, for uh, unauthorized change, that, that amount of unauthorized change on a particular asset um, can be used and should be used as a determining factor for whether or not access can be granted to particular resources. Um, you can look at that as a, a percentage of unauthorized change that occurs on a particular asset if you like, um, but this idea that um, unmanaged assets are inherently more risky, and unmanaged assets also inherently have more unauthorized change. Um, so unauthorized change gives you a, a perspective or a, a mechanism to determine how managed, how well managed an asset is, and that is particularly relevant for zero trust. So that, that brings us close to the conclusion here, um, and in order to drive us to a conclusion, um, I think I wanted to, to review the, the statements that we saw throughout this deck. So there were a number of slides that had sort of a single statement on them. Um, and they, they add up um, is kind of the way that I think about it. So we'll go back to the beginning. 
with zero trust is not a product. Um, zero trust is a concept, and, and that's important to internalize. You can't purchase zero trust. Um, it's more than just a product to purchase. Every incident begins with a change, and any incident actually involves multiple changes. So when you're thinking about change detection um, and how to detect changes and how they're related to incidents in your environment, it's not just a single change, but multiple changes that you have to be worried about. And integrity monitoring is therefore more than change detection. Um, so integrity monitoring is a process built on top of change detection. Integrity monitoring is foundational to zero trust. So we established how um, the, the, the first step for building a zero trust architecture has to be establishing the trusted state of the components involved in that zero trust architecture, and then making sure that they stay in that trusted state over time. And then finally, um, assessing security posture also requires integrity. So when you're building an integrity monitoring foundation for your zero trust architecture, you're also putting in place um, some of the requirements necessary for uh, assessing uh, access requests in a zero trust process, in a zero trust architecture. And with that, I'd just like to thank you for spending the time with me. I hope it was a, an interesting and useful education, gave you something not just to think about, but something to actually do in your environment. And I'm happy to uh, take questions um, offline, obviously, as this is a recorded presentation. But if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me.